Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining our fourth webinar in our Six Stops to Success series. Um, it's called Partnering with Local Officials, and we are really looking forward to the guests that we have um, joining us today. If you have any questions, we will be taking questions at the end, so please type your questions into the little question chat box, and we will be sure to answer those at the end. Um, and if you have any logistical questions about anything, you can type them in there as well. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to our first presenter, Art Gazzetti. With local officials is what we're here to talk about today. Good, new, uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining uh, today's webinar. Uh, this is part of a webinar series organized jointly by the Center for Transportation Excellence and the National Alliance of Public Transportation advocates all focused on tactics, strategies, and messages for winning transit elections. Uh, I'm Art Gazzetti. I'm the Vice President for Policy of APTA, the American Public Transportation Association, and uh, long time associated with both CFTE and NAPTA. I want to give a shout out for the, the chair of APTA, Valerie McCall a board transit board member from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Valerie has underscored uh, in her term as chair a uh, collaboration. And the, uh, the, the power of partnerships is being fundamental. Uh, the working relationship with uh, transit agencies and local elected leaders, it's a hand in glove uh, relationship. Uh, today's webinar is spot on in focusing on that topic. That's why I uh, want it to be part of this webinar in particular, and also to give a good shout out uh, to Valerie for really emphasizing that theme in her year as chair. Uh, three very good friends of transit, three champions of transit, part of this year's webinar, or this uh, today's webinar. Uh, Rob Johnson, now a, a member of the Seattle City Council, but for years toiled in the vineyards as an advocate at the grassroots level in, the, uh, in, in Seattle and in Washington State. Uh, Sig Hutchinson, uh, Mr. Green Jeans, a, a now a, a commissioner in Wake County Board of Commissioners, but a transit board member at uh, Triangle Transit and a champion um, uh, for transit throughout the research go one go through one by one and then have questions at the end and being an hour, and we'll join adjourn at, uh, at at three o'clock Eastern time. So, uh, Rob, we'll start off with you, and uh, invite your presentation. Hear me, okay? So, uh, so I am Rob. I am a Seattle City Council member. Uh, I've been on the job over four months now and I'm really excited to talk with you today a little bit about the ways that we as advocates can do a good job of making the case to uh, local officials for more public transit. As Art mentioned, I spent most of my career in the nonprofit side as the staff member and executive director of a local nonprofit called Transportation Choices Coalition. Uh, we are Washington's largest advocacy organization and a lot of the hallmarks of our successes have been helping to pass ballot all throughout the state to increase funding for uh, bike lanes, sidewalks, and transit. So I'm going to go to the next slide uh, and talk a little bit about the uh, problem we to expand bus service in King County. Um, King County is the Seattle area uh, county. It's uh, about 40% of the state's population and about 60% uh, of the state's jobs. So we are a big economic engine in the region. It also carries 
uh, King County bus service carries in the neighborhood of about 400,000 passengers a day. So a very significant element of our resources to help increase funding for bus service in King County. Um, King County is a creature of the state legislature, so like all creatures of the state legislature, um, it requires legislative authorization for new funding sources. Uh, the county had been maxed out of its funding sources for uh, nearly a decade um, and was working really hard to try to identify uh, new resources to continue maintain the existing service and grow as our population grew. So we spent five years uh, working on uh, state authorization to authorize transportation benefit districts. Um, that required a really huge local effort to lobby, to organize, and build coalitions at the county and city level as well as the state level. And I wanted to highlight a couple of things that I think were really critical for the success of passing the, uh, the, the necessary legislation in our state capital to give us the authority. Um, to go to the ballot. The first was using data as a really good narrative. Um, and the data was critically important for us because it required us to, to do a good job of telling the story about the need. And that data needed to come from the county, i.e. the transit agency, but it also needed to come from advocacy groups and from the general public. Um, the riders of the system needed to stand up and advocate for how important the uh, additional resources were that data need to be, needed to be supported and consistent from the data that was coming out of the county. Um, and advocacy groups needed to have buy-in on that data as well. So I thought that data was a really important element to telling a really good story. If, if you don't have the sort of consistency between the agency, the advocates, and the public around the need, it's very difficult to tell the story about why you should get more resources. So uh, moving along, hopefully. Hey, Rob. Yep. Sorry, this is Kirsten. Um, for some reason, your slides aren't, aren't popping up. Let me just, um, my apologies, let me just make sure that you are, oh, there we go. Perfect. OK, now? now they're up. I'm so sorry about that. If you can just resume from where you were um, in the PowerPoint. Yep, my fault. Here's the background slide that you, you missed. And we'll move along to the next one. Apologies. Thank you. So uh, once we actually had the authority uh, from the state legislature, then we moved sort of into the campaign um, element of this. And this campaign was in 2014, so it's pretty fresh data just in terms of uh, uh, you know, the kinds of conversations that we're having um, as, a, as a local advocates today. Um, this is a pretty recent story. So in order to build the political coalition that we needed to get this thing to the ballot, the, um, the political uh, at local uh, electeds throughout the region had decided the best path forward was to uh, pair transit service with road infrastructure. So the plan that was put in front of voters uh, initially had a 60% of the plan for transit and 40% for roadways. The challenge of that was that um, the polling indicated that we, were have, we had pretty soft levels of support um, when you pair those two things together. That was in large part because the 60% of funding that was going to go to transit was going to go to basically backfill budget shortfalls. So people were going to pay a lot in taxes and they weren't going to actually get any new service. We thought that that was going to be OK because we'd be able to tell a really good story about the local road infrastructure because the local elected said that they would be able to deliver those votes. That didn't actually end up coming to fruition. When, uh, when we went out to the ballot and, uh, in April of 2014, we got our butts kicked. Um, and we got our butts kicked uh, in the exit polls uh, identified for three particular reasons. One, people thought that they were paying a lot of taxes for, for not any new transit service. Two, we never really uh, told a good story about the road infrastructure needs. And so people didn't believe us that, that actually any of the money was going for roads. And three, we had a very significant turnout in um, the rural environment, um, which we thought would translate to uh, good yes votes for us because of the real rural road needs. 
but it actually ended up being a, a very significant negative for us. So we were rejected by 54% to 46% um, in an April special election. So there was a, a moment of crisis um, where a lot of us advocates got into a room and said, how do we, to, how do we preserve this service? Um, and, and we built a, a second round campaign that started to pressure uh, the city of Seattle to go back to the ballot in November to try to maintain the, the existing bus service that we had. So to get politicians back on board, we started building some good political pressure. Um, there, there was a, a very intentional strategy that we built between um, advocacy groups that had a very positive relationship with the, the mayor and the existing city council. So they played the good cop role. And then we had some folks who were really staunch bad cops who were outside the agency and pushing uh, really hard for a um, public initiative that would actually go to the ballot without the consent of the city council or the mayor. So that good cop, bad cop role really created a, a large political narrative that forced some ownership by City Hall to really uh, take on this issue. Um, the media was very critical to, to getting the campaign back to the ballot. Um, we had broad level support from the non-traditional media, which um, it's starting to be a larger and larger influence, I think, on traditional media. So we had a lot of social media and blog posts that were calling for the city to take action. And that started to, to strongly influence the traditional media structure. And once we had actually built the political will to put the thing back on the ballot, we knew we had a very strong uh, campaign that we needed to, to change from April to November in order to win. The, the four main focus for us for, uh, for getting to the ballot and passing really had to do with a better field strategy. From April to November, we wanted to focus a lot more on a field presence. Um, secondly, we, we had a little more lead time, so we thought we could do a better job of fundraising, and we did. Um, we focused a lot more communications on new media and social media as opposed to the traditional media sources we thought would have a big impact. And most importantly, the data point, we use the uh, voters network uh, with something called Transit Score that's been developed by a bunch of different advocacy organizations to target the folks that we thought would be really high likelihood yes votes. Using all of those resources, we, we went back to the ballot and were approved by just over 62% on a much higher turnout election. Um, so uh, I think that those things really contributed to uh, the success. Um, so uh, one of the things that I would say I've learned moving from a, a lobbyist uh, to uh, an elected official is to really um, spend a lot of time and energy uh, with advocacy organizations as uh, is important to keep your ears on the ground. But I think for advocates, it's also critically important to make sure that you're doing a good job of engaging with those local elected officials in every phase of your process, whether it's in um, message development or implementation of strategies, getting that kind of buy-in from folks early on can really build to some long-term um, successes. And here's a couple of examples of things that we have been able to do over the last couple of years to, uh, to help uh, push elected officials um, in various different local agencies to uh, get themselves ready for major infrastructure. So in 2015, we worked with the state legislature to adopt a $16 billion package. Um, we've, we are now working on shaping a $50 billion Sound Transit 3 package for, for passage this November. And generally, I think that um, as we exit my version of the, of the presentation, generally that I think uh, the most important thing for me is, uh, as a local elected, is really hearing from advocates uh, about the challenges ahead on funding and working very closely with my colleagues at the local level to ensure that we're um, meeting the needs of, of those riders of today and of tomorrow. As cities like Seattle are experiencing really significant uh, growth, we've got to be able to meet that growth with a much higher level of service from the, uh, the transit agencies. And that's requiring not only a lot of operating dollars, but a lot of capital dollars, too. So hopefully that was helpful um, as a little background about what I think it takes to be successful in lobbying local elected officials. And I think at this point, I, I transition into the next presenter. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and now we will move over to um, hear from Sig Hutchinson. Let me just pull his slides up. Perfect. 
and take it away, Sig. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. It's great to be with everyone today. I am Sig Hutchinson. I'm Vice Chair of the Board of the Wake County Commission in Wake County, North Carolina. Um, we've been in the news a bit lately. It's quite unfortunate to be in the news in the way that we are. Um, and that, but it does speak to the headwinds that we face when we're not organized and speaking in a unified voice about uh, how important things such as transit is uh, to our region. Uh, North Carol um, Wake County is um, about a million people. Uh, we are part of a regional uh, system of transportation, three counties, Orange, Durham, uh, and Wake County, about 1.7 million people in the region. I, Wake County is the largest of the three. Um, we've got a transit referendum on the ballot this November for about $2.3 billion over 10 years, uh, which has been quite some doing to actually get that on the ballot. Uh, for me personally, I've been in North Carolina for about 30 years, politically active for about 20, and I've been a Wake County Commissioner now for about uh, about a year and a half. Uh, throughout my career as an advocate, uh, I've led uh, six referendums for open space, parks, greenways, affordable housing, transportation. Uh, though all of those those referendums passed by 70 percent or more. Uh, I've also worked with APTA, traveling around to uh, three cities to help them organize their uh, transit referendums. Um, so what I'm looking to do is to get this referendum uh, passed by what we believe somewhere between the upper 50s to the lower uh, 60%. Um, the two other counties in our region, Orange and Durham County, have already passed a half cent sales tax for uh, transit, which has been approved by the legislature to, to allow us to do that. Uh, so we basically uh, have been behind the, the times. Um, we had a very conservative uh, Wake County Commission, which stopped a lot of our initiatives uh, moving forward, which was uh, one of the reasons that I actually ran uh, back in 2014, and not only did I win, but I brought three of my colleagues with me, and so we basically have uh, a control of the Wake County Commission, and so that's why we're going to be putting it on the ballot in uh, in November. Uh, I'm not a political consultant. Uh, you might say I am a politician, but my real skill set comes just in terms of communication skills. Uh, I was the Carnegie instructor. For those of you who remember Mr. Carnegie, he wrote a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People talking about human relation skills and public speaking. Uh, and for me, it's all about building relationships. It's all about communicating. It's painting a picture of what ultimately our voters want to, to, to have happen in our region. Uh, and to, the, to, to all of that, it comes together in, in successful efforts that we'll be talking about today. Uh, I have five main points that I would like to leave you with. Um, which hopefully will help you in your efforts to get uh, a successful uh, pass on your referendums. Uh, and so with that being said, the first point um, that I'd like to make is that referendums are won and lost uh, long before the campaign begins. I cannot overemphasize this enough um, in that, um, you know, you've got to build these relationships with people. Um, and if you see a problem early on before you actually start the campaign, uh, those problems are not going to be going away unless you actually deal with them. Uh, it, uh, Kristen and Art asked me to talk about working with elected officials specifically, so in addition to everyone else, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to work with ele elected officials and, and get them on board uh, with supporting a campaign. Uh, I've been working with the health and wellness community for uh, 10 years. And then we were putting together a legislative agenda, and they were talking about, you know, how do you educate these uh, these legislators on the issues that are important to health and wellness? Of which my response to them was, well, if you can get the right people elected, uh, then many times education takes care of itself. And so I have always been a big advocate of finding the right people to run for office, uh, getting them elected, building relationships with people uh, before. Uh, before they run for office, during their campaigns, and then after they're elected, stay in, in touch with them. Uh, everything is so much nicer when you get the right people elected. Uh, if you cannot get the right people elected or they're not currently in office, the next best thing is to get the right people to talk to them. 
Um, you know, as an elected official now, I can clearly say people lobby us all, all the time. And so uh, credibility is king, is what I would say. So you have to get the right people talking to them. Uh, one of the things that you might do is just think with your friends of who knows this elected official in a positive way. Uh, you can always go to the, um, the, the voter files or the election commission and see who gives money to these people. Um, but if you can get to them in a positive way with the right people, um, that's always a very, very good way to go. Uh, and then the next thing is if, you, if they are going to go against you, then you need another strategy, which is to uh, think about how you might get them to soften their message or soften their position a bit. So rather than just to come out and say, I'm totally against this, if they could say, well, um, I believe in we should just let the voters decide. Or um, it, they may see something like, well, I'm going to vote against it, but I'm going to let the voters decide and then let every, and then work from there. So try to get them not to advocate against the referendum, but to soften that position. Um, the next thing that is important in terms of getting it on the referendum is, I like to say, to know every step of the process and have someone at every step who can advocate for your interest. Here in, in Wake County, we have 12 municipalities. There are three counties, two MPOs, uh, six transit agencies, and various adv advocacy groups and organizations. It has been a long, 10-year, arduous uh, journey with multiple steps along the way. Uh, and the only way we ultimately have gotten here is that uh, we, we have put someone at every step of that process who understands our interest and uh, understands how to advocate for our interest so that ultimately you know, we can get through that process and move on to the, ne to the next process. I will say one of the interesting dynamics that have happened is it's so, it's so interesting how everything starts at the top. And as soon as we came in as new county commissioners, it's just you know, all of the, the, the whole conversation changed. And the, business community got on board, the progressive community got on board, all the MPOs got on board, my mayors got on board, and it's so, it's so much easier to be thinking about every step of those ways and having an advocate when you ultimately have uh, control at the top. But I love this Andy Grove quote, only the paranoid survive, and uh, you, ha you cannot let one step pass without at least thinking about it and thinking about who your advocates are. Uh, at, at, at that meeting to, to make sure your interests are being represented and for you to hear back from them. So be sure to stay in touch with those people as well. Um, I love this point. This is point number three. And I actually learned this when I was traveling around the, the country working for APTA. Uh, and that is that so many times it's not the opposition, opposition that causes you to lose a referendum as much as it, it is when your supporters turn against you. Um, we have seen this in so many places around the country is that you know, someone starts a referendum and somebody decides they're going to go against it. It might be the business community because they're not getting what they want, or the environmental community because you know, it goes through a sensitive area, or the African American community because it doesn't give them what they're wanting. So this is where that, that point previously about you, know, you win or lose the referendum long before the campaign starts. And it's so important to build those relationships, those positive relationships with those various stakeholders. And I've mentioned several here on the screen, the environmental community, the progressive community, the business community, et cetera, et cetera. I can say within our referendum, everybody's on the bus. So um, we clearly um, you know, see the importance uh, of that. Now, I will say that a lot of it is like whack-a-mole. Um, it's hard to keep everybody on the bus, so somebody gets, you know, their feelings hurt, or um, you know, you have to you have to deal with them, and so yet you, you kind of have to constantly be moving around, massaging people, making sure everybody's happy. Uh, there's there's also a couple of other components I'll call grassroots and grass tops. You know, grassroots. Uh, we have a great advocacy group called, uh, which is a friends group called Capillary Friends of Transit which is out there advocating and, advo and educating at that grassroots level, uh, at the grass tops level. Um, we've, <laughs> we've elevated that up with credibility to the chamber. 
so the chamber is clearly involved in this. And so we've got the grass tops, we've got the grass roots, and we've got all of our stakeholders clearly involved and supportive of, of, of where, uh, where we ultimately are going. Um, this I love. This is my fourth point, and it's a speak into the listening of your audience. It sounds a little strange, but there's not a better way of putting it. Uh, your audience is listening to you in a certain way, and that, that, that listening comes from their life experiences, um, their income, um, where they live, you know, uh, all of these things that make up you know, who we are. And so what you have to do is that you, first you have to understand how they are listening to this conversation, uh, and then you have to speak to their listening. So. Um, you know, the, when I talk to people about public speaking, um, and you know, the two things I ask them for to think about is who is your audience, and think about how your audience is listening to this conversation, and then think about the other the other thing I've mentioned to them is what is the unanswered question? What's the unanswered question that they are thinking about as they are listening to your presentation? Uh, we did this. We tried to get this to move forward in 2008, and we're just not successful at actually getting on the ballot. And one of the things the conversation, uh, the, the, the community was having, is that it did not go to the airport, and so that was the unanswered question when you went into uh, when you went into groups. And in many ways, that's still the unanswered question. So as we are talking to groups, uh, and particularly choice rider groups. The first thing we have to do out of the shoot is answer that question of, well, yes, ultimately this is this is going going to the airport. But every audience has a different unanswered question. Every audience has needs that they they need to be that need to be addressed. Um, so if you're speaking to need riders, you know you obviously need to be talking in a different way than if you're talking to choice riders or if you're talking to millennials. So it, all of this is ultimately gets down to uh, messaging, and even though there is going to be a general message for your your campaign, you also need to understand the audience that you're speaking to and how they are all different, and then speak to that uh, that audience. I heard one of um, I think it was Rob talked about the importance of polling, and we have a great consultant who's working with us on this campaign who's done some great polling, and we have done a lot around understanding even from a micro perspective you know just ge geographical differences uh, in our county then and, and that North Wake is very different than South Wake uh, about how we ultimately are going to be talking to them but more importantly how they are ultimately list, listening to this conversation so that's number four let me finish up in about three or four minutes on the my fifth point and I love the way this is framed it says run silent run deep my very first um, campaign back in 2000, uh, I was promoting open space, uh, open space uh, referendum to to preserve open space uh, natural areas. And I, I was just so adamant I wanted to go go hard against my uh, the people who uh, who opposed me, and I would get on all the talk shows, and I would try to beat all these people up. And a uh, sage uh, ex mayor who had been around for 30 years came to me and said, "Sig." Seriously, dude, don't aggravate the opposition. You know, speak to your base, get them out to vote, uh, but but don't aggravate the opposition. And we were recently in uh, San Diego where they had a referendum, and their consultants were saying the same thing. Uh, and this is this is ultimately where I got that of, of run silent, run deep. Uh, basically, you know, you, you don't want to to engage in just a shouting match around transit. It, 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 you want to stay on message. Um, one of the things I learned in campaigning is that um, the less that you talk about it once you have their vote, the better. Um, you know, once someone says, Sig, I'm voting for you, that's it. I had to teach my wife that. That's it. Don't say anything else. You got the vote. One of the things that we found in our polling is that we are polling at about 70% approval. But once you start talking about it, once you you know they start asking questions, well, what's this going to cost me in terms of half cent sales tax, or you know, I, what about all these buses that you know I see that are not full, or 
you know, are these buses really going to pay for themselves? You know, the more you start talking about it, the more your support ultimately erodes. So once you have their support, and the, the real key message for us this time around is congestion for the triangle. So we have to deal with that trend, that congestion. And, and for many of our riders and the way that they're listening to it, you say, look, are you, you tired of this congestion? Oh, yeah. Well, obviously we need more transportation options, which is why we're putting this, this transit referendum on the ballot. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm for that. Boom, you got them. So I mentioned don't argue with the opposition. Stay positive. Stay on message. Organize your sport, your supporters. I talked about that earlier on of having everybody on the bus speaking in a unified voice. All your supporters there. Organize and speak to your, your base. Stay on message. Stay on message. Stay on message. And then finally, the, the micro-targeting of your audience in a way that they are listening. So, you know, we're going to be doing a lot with uh, social media. We're going to be doing a lot with, uh, uh, with direct mail. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot with experts speaking about the importance of this from the business community to the universities and colleges, the African American communities to the to the, to the millennials, so that those those uh, community leaders, those leaders in the community, as there's as this conversation is taking place, they're all talking about the importance of getting this done. So. Carl Jung talks about this collective unconsciousness. I believe within the community there is a collective consciousness. And what you'd have to do is to drive that collective consciousness with people that they know and respect and listen to so that all of these various interest groups are collectively on the bus supporting your referendum, which is going to move us towards November with a successful referendum. Thank you so much for your time. Great, thank you so much. Let me now pass it over to Mike Alexander. Um, let me just pull up his screen. Give me one second. And Mike, do you see the, the pop-up to share your screen? Perfect, okay. You got it, thank you. Sounds good. Take it away. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I loved everything that um, the other presenters talked about. In fact, we added a few slides while they were talking. And in fact, one of the slides that we just uh, we just added, um, you'll see in just a second. And I think it'll be very interesting given um, votes on transportation. But again, the Atlanta MPO area is a very, very large area. Uh, 13 entire counties, seven partial counties. We have over 100 municipalities in our planning area. We represent over 50% of the state of Georgia's population. And of course, transportation is a big issue here. And the earlier comments about uh, transit, I think, were very, very well put uh, as it relates to metropolitan Atlanta. And this is actually a map that I made uh, the day after our big vote on July 31st uh, regarding uh, uh, 10 county T spots. And of course, that T spot uh, failed, and I wanted to see where it passed. So I took the voter precinct data, and I made this map to show what voter precincts actually passed uh, the referendum. And you can see that's a very in-town picture of who actually supported uh, the T spots. And that T spot did have a lot of transit service, and our agency was really out front um, trying to talk about the economic and transportation benefits of that t spot but again, in the suburban areas of metropolitan Atlanta, uh, it really wasn't very popular. And of course, so it went down in flames, and there's a link there that I'll send uh, to you guys. Uh, TS is t spot I misspelled that. Um, yeah, t spot So again, there's a, there's a well-written article about that process that uh, you guys should, should look at that when you have uh, more time. So of course it went down in flames, recession, we were just coming out of the recession uh, when that vote didn't pass. But again, early on in the process, before the law was passed that enabled this vote to occur, we had lobbied for our local governments to be allowed to form their own uh, multi-jurisdictional areas to vote on the t spots But what the legislature actually passed was this 10-county area, and that didn't work. So. We knew we had to just we had to shift gears, 
and that we had truthfully a blind spot in what our understanding of what people really wanted uh, with respect to the transportation systems uh, were. So we went ahead and formed uh, up with other partners to do a very detailed public opinion survey. And of course, I'm not going to read all this, but the point is now that every year we are polling uh, Metro Atlanta residents uh, with a significance level plus or minus five percentage points at the county level now. And last year's survey, we surveyed over 5,200 people about their perceptions of how Metro Atlanta is doing. And of course, we're in our third year, and this last year, one of the big questions we asked, and we mirrored this after a Houston study, is, you know, what do you think the biggest issue facing Metro Atlanta is? And the first year we asked it, it was actually the economy. And that made a lot of sense, and it's one of the reasons the teeth floss didn't do very well, because people weren't doing uh, very well. And each year, um, the share of people that are, uh, respond that transportation is the number one issue has increased. So now, region-wide, that number is up to almost 27% of all people think transportation is the number one issue. And of course, um, you can see those variations at the county level. So what this creates for us is a much more sophisticated um, feedback mechanism to our own local government about what their actual citizens think about these transportation and transit issues. Because we do ask directly about transit. An overwhelming majority of Metro Atlanta residents, even in the most rural areas, think um, public transit is very important to the future of Metro Atlanta. And it's great to have this um, as an actual data point that you can go talk to local elected officials with to tell them that this is actually what their citizens want. So if we ask them each year, you know, what do you think the best way to fix our traffic problems actually are, um, we can give them real data that says, you know, this year 44% think expanding public transit is the best way to fix our traffic problems in Metro Atlanta. So this has been an unbelievable um, change in the way we talk to our elected officials about what we ought to be doing with the transportation uh, system in and of itself. And of course, one of the other things we've done is we decided to go out and talk to the millennials. And uh, we built a task force of 350 millennials to talk about um, how they perceived Metro Atlanta and what they thought uh, was important. And that actually led to them forming their own group, Advance Atlanta. And Advance Atlanta is committed to uh, promoting transit uh, across the region. And so that's been another thing we've done as a regional planning agency to help promote uh, th these issues. And of course, the state legislature went back to the drawing table and passed another bill. Um, related to transportation funding. It was mostly road-centric, HB 170. Um, that's really reset our gas tax. They did not do much for transit in that bill. But what they did do is they, uh, they passed legislation to allow local governments individually uh, at the county level to do another transportation-oriented spot. So I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Um, so. What we have been focused on at the ARC is really seeding our local government to make sure they're ready in case those kinds of opportunities uh, come up. So one of the things we've been doing is we've been funding transportation plans for our local government for quite a long time now, uh, almost 10 years. And we provide direct transportation project delivery support. So for some of our smaller local governments and transit agencies, we help them navigate the process of getting stuff actually uh, built and then and help to prioritize those projects. We've got some slides about that. And then of course, uh, we do directly provide technical support on local sales tax uh, referendum, and we're going to review that in a little bit. So we're very proud of our CTP program. Um, it directly provides assistance through um, federal transportation dollars for them to do their own local government uh, plans to help program what they need. And this turned out to be really critical. Uh, and we didn't know it would be critical at the time, but uh, funding these studies and getting them into the right place with their project prioritization and knowing what they wanted to actually do uh, was a great seed for these local, these local sales taxes that are mostly going to come up for a vote now 
uh, in the fall, and it's the two big counties that are going to undergo a, a vote, and that'll be Fulton County and DeKalb County. So we use those local government plans as input into our regional plans. We try to update them every five years to keep them um, relevant, and it really sets a priority for the local governments and helps them develop their community vision. But the unintended benefit of it is that it real, really helps us strengthen our relationships with our local governments. And of course, obviously, these are comprehensive transportation plans, so it includes lots of um, work done on state of good repair and roadways, but it does include transit. And where uh, this gets to be really interesting is it helps to see uh, local governments. One of the things that we probably haven't called out enough in our own messaging is that, in fact, uh, in 2014, Clayton County, the, one of our southern counties, um, where the airport is actually located in metropolitan Atlanta, uh, voted in and decided to join MARTA. So that was the largest expansion of MARTA since its inception. So we now have three counties uh, in the MARTA system. So we're really proud of that. But one of the things um, that we know is that we seeded a lot of the planning work associated with the routes and transit service that will be provided in Clayton through that CTP uh, process. And of course, if you look across the MPO area, you'll see the number of plans that we've actually funded, uh, the most recent plan, and what the update schedule will be for those across. And of course, that blue in the center is the city of Atlanta. Uh, Clayton County is to uh, the south. This is Clayton County that just voted in Martin. And of course, this is Fulton County and DeKalb County. So uh, this work is ongoing, but again, we're helping the local governments to understand their own vision. Now, if we're just thinking about supporting uh, transit initiatives, we continue to leverage our uh, ability to, to allocate federal funds to support transit initiatives. So we, uh, we typically try to support EIS work and LPA work. Um, and we've done that directly uh, recently, $7.5 million in direct uh, funding assistance. The other thing that's unique for us at the ARC is um, we're very into modeling here, and we have an advanced uh, traffic model, an activity-based model. We also have advanced land use models, and we're a REMI shop. We have a REMI econometric model um, here. So what we've been able to do is leverage all those tools uh, to help do uh, travel demand modeling for MARTA directly, and then forecast what the economic benefits of those particular large-scale MARTA projects would be um, for the region. And they've used that in their own planning work, which is something we're really, really uh, excited about. So I won't go through that complete list of everything we've done to support uh, transit initiatives, but you, I think you get a feel for how comprehensive our um, our planning work has been here at the ARC. And again, it, it can't emphasize enough what it means to have uh, the ability to fund CTPs that in areas where you're not going to have classic rail, but you are going to have um, local HST service planning uh, for those jurisdictions that that gets funded up uh, in, in those CTPs. And of course, we, we've gotten a national grant to build uh, trip planning website that we're really proud, proud of that consolidates all of the different transit services in Metro Atlanta. And you see that website, www.atltransit.org, uh, to help people make those trips across those different um, transit service operator areas. And the other thing that we know is uh, it's really about getting things done and getting things done as quickly and efficiently as possible. So we spend a lot of time actually on project delivery for our local governments and MARTA. And of course, you see a picture here of uh, actually the most recent streetcar line that's been developed in uh, Metro Atlanta. So we've, we've done some work on that that I think you guys will find interesting. So this is an interdisciplinary approach, which means we try to put planners and engineers all in the same room um, with multiple layers of local government so that we've got really everybody that potentially could impact the way a project gets delivered. And what this has forced us to do is really to take a, a truly regional 
approach and the way we're thinking about policies and innovative uh, business practices. Now, of course, there's challenges with all this. The environmental studies and review continue to be uh, something that dogs everyone and takes up significant amounts of time. And getting the right project concepts is always a challenge. And then, of course, fitting these projects into their different contexts is something that we're always trying to properly scope uh, to help them understand um, what, it, what the real likely time it's going to take uh, to, to get that. So we make that linkage back to the CTPs um, through sc screening elements. And what this really helps us to do is to speed up the process when you go over to the Georgia Department of Transportation to do the planning in a proper way to make sure that the projects that are most likely to get built get advanced as early as, as, as possible. And GDOT really likes this because we don't waste their time with projects that aren't likely to get built. So these screening processes, as you can see, that's a pretty complicated diagram to help them think about these projects in a thoughtful way to make sure they understand the full implications um, and do it much earlier than they would have typically done it, which is really the big success of this. And of course, we, we love to make spreadsheets. So we've also done uh, something that I think is very unique. We built uh, a spreadsheet to help the local governments do an initial scan to see how risky their different projects actually are. And then scores them um, so that they can know uh, very directly, well, have I got anything that really, really is highlightable that's going to be a problem to, to get these, these, these projects advanced? And of course, if you guys want to look at the way we do program delivery, uh, you can see more about that on our website. Now, getting back to the teeth floss, and again, remember all the stuff I, I said about our Metro Atlanta Speak Survey and programming all that up. So um, given that most residents now think that transportation is the number one issue, and of course that uh, transit is the best way to address this, um, with that new state law, it allowed the local governments in Fulton County, and you see them in gray, uh, red on the statewide map, uh, to work together to determine uh, what type of format that they wanted to go for additional resources. Because the reality is uh, the state of Georgia really doesn't put state money into transit. MARTA itself, if you're not aware, is funded by a one penny sales tax. And of course, uh, was initially developed with some federal uh, money that we competed against Seattle for uh, back in the 70s. And of course, we used that money to build the initial system, and its ongoing um, maintenance and expansion has been done through this penny sales tax. Uh, the problem with the penny sales tax for transit is there wasn't a lot of money for Fulton County or DeKalb County, the two initial counties in Marta, to do other things, especially on the road side. So what uh, this negotiated agreement uh, in the state bill allows for now is that the city of Atlanta is actually going to vote in the fall uh, for its own sales tax. So uh, we really, the state legislature had to give uh, space for those northern cities in Fulton County, the northern suburbs, uh, to go out on their own because we didn't think there would be a general agreement with all the cities. The original law said that all the cities had to agree uh, on the project list to go forward with this teeth loss, and that was a real problem. So now the city of Atlanta is on its own. Uh, they're going to go for a half half penny for MARTA and a half penny for their own teeth loss, which would be mostly road-oriented bridge projects. But that 0.5 MARTA sales tax will allow them to do a lot. That half penny will allow them to do a lot. It will allow them to probably, uh, depending on the political circumstances, to build um, light rail out to Emory University, which has been a big project for us that's been planned for for a long time, to build transit along our Beltline project, which I think has got a lot of national attention, and of course build additional streetcar. So the city of Atlanta is very excited about this potential additional revenue. At the same time, in the areas uh, across the county outside of uh, the city of Atlanta, they're going to propose a .75 uh, teeth floss just for roads. They could always come back and take that .25 and, and, 
And so they started to put together their list. And interesting, one of the things we've noticed with the, the northern, northern suburb cities, a lot of those projects are very much trail, bike, pedestrian oriented. Last mile connectivity projects um, where there are transit uh, stations outside of the city of Atlanta. So um, some widenings in the very northern suburbs, but in fact, lots of trail projects that will support multimodal activity. And again, we've been providing technical support to those projects, um, getting onto this list. And these lists have to be approved by May 31st. So this is very, uh, very, very relevant in, in a sense of, of actual time. And again, most of those projects that they're proposing they have ready in the hopper because they've been doing CTP. So this is where we feel really great as an MPO is that we've uh, funded these planning studies for the North Fulton area, for the city of Atlanta, for the South Fulton area. So they actually have a vision for what they want to do. If they hadn't done those CTPs, and in fact done those CTPs in North Fulton and South Fulton's case, multi-jurisdictional transportation plans, they probably wouldn't be ready to produce a list by May 31st. So this has been really great uh, for the ARC that we were able to be at the right place at the right time um, to help them to get ready for the sales tax votes in the fall. Similarly, DeKalb County, um, different structure is also going to um, modify their uh, special purpose local option sales tax and their, their host taxes to do something similar, but I think they're going to do um, something that's mostly road oriented in this case, and it'll actually have projects that aren't just transportation, but they're going to be voting on a penny sales tax as well. And of course, almost all the jur jurisdictions in Metro Atlanta uh, are dependent on SPLOFs uh, for funding for transportation, Cherokee, Gwinnett, Cobb, um, Fayette, Henry. Rockdale all have versions of SWAS that they use uh, to fund their transportation. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, and thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so what I am going to do now is just give me one second while I put my, my screen back up. OK. And um, I am going to, so thank you so much to our three presenters, um, definitely some very informative um, presentations. Uh, Art, I will pass it over to you to answer any, to ask any questions you might have and also to answer any from the audience. Yes, we uh, uh, have in the, in the remaining time some uh, questions to go over here and, and I will uh, uh, throw one uh, to uh, uh, Rob Johnson specifically first. And uh, Rob, you mentioned about your two campaigns. Uh, that uh, uh, you know the difference in tactics between the unsuccessful campaign and the uh, and the part two, uh, but was the question the same, or was it a different question that's actually being considered by the voters? Uh, <clears throat> great question, Art. Um, the question wasn't identical. You know, we had a, a, a political environment in question one that required us to include roads. Um, question two was just about transit. That certainly helped improve the um, chance of winning because transit tends to be a very popular thing for us in the Puget Sound region. I would also say that geography mattered a little bit. Question one was focused on the entirety of the county. Question two was focused mostly just on the city of Seattle. That said, um, we had you know, very significant uh, differences in just the campaign structure um, from April to November. And we'd like to think that the, those um, changes to structure around data, fundraising, uh, higher emphasis on field, communications focused on social media as opposed to traditional media, that those made a very big difference in um, getting us uh, over the top in November. Very good. Um, a question, uh, and Kirsten, you might want to help on this one as well here. Uh, questions, you know, people were taking, dutifully taking notes on the slides and weren't able to get all the notes. Are we able to, uh, you know, how can people get a hold of these slides? And also, is there permission from the presenters to use the slides in their, uh, their own work? So we will be posting the recorded webinar as well as a PDF of the slides um, on our website after the 
um, after the webinar, probably later today or tomorrow. Um, so on the CFTE website, in terms of using presentation material, I have to check in with our presenters um, and let you guys know. If you have specific questions about that, please email me at info at cfte.org, and I can um, certainly get more information on that and pass that along. All right, uh, thank you. A question uh, directed specifically to, to SIG. Uh, SIG, your slide, which talks about referendums won and lost long before the campaign begins. Uh, just thinking ahead to the fall, there's a big uh, presidential election, uh, possibly a polarizing election. We'll see. But uh, uh, are you adjusting uh, the campaign in that context? And I guess the question could uh, extend to other presenters as well. Yeah, um, Art, that's a great question. Um, and I think that you know North Carolina is a very purple state. Um, we can go either way depending on who shows up. Um, we are we feel very positive about um, the election uh, this November in terms of um, if I have to be a little partisan here. I hope that's okay. Um, but uh, Democrats tend to support transit, and uh, we are very excited about our list of candidates um, on the Democratic ticket. There's also a lot of positive things going on in Wake County that a lot of Wake County, statewide candidates are from Wake County. But uh, to your point, um, Art, we're going to be working very hard on the Get Out the Vote campaign to make sure that uh, we are energizing those votes, those, those voters who are energized about the uh, vote in November and making sure that not only do they show up, but they go all the way down to the bottom of the ballot, uh, since trans is going to be the very last thing, and so they have to go to the bottom of the ballot to make sure that they click a yes for transit. Good. Uh, thank you, Sig. Uh, and, and a question uh, specifically towards Mike. Uh, Mike, you made reference to a well-written article on the 2012 Peace Blast vote and why it lost. Uh, where can one find that? Uh, so I put the link into the PowerPoint, and I just sent the final PowerPoint back up to you guys. So uh, if you actually go to the Southern Spaces website, if you just want to Google it, Southern Spaces Peace Blast, you would find the article, I think. But it's a, it's a really interesting read on the politics of, of why the vote went down in plain. <laughs> No, good. And, Thank yeah, you, Art. Once again, I'll make sure that those, those slides are up so you can definitely have access to all of the links that were in, in the PowerPoint. All right, I just want to go back to the, uh, this is Rob Johnson, um, yep. just wanted to say to people, obviously, you know, we've won a lot of different campaigns in Washington State. Um, November is generally the best time for everybody to go, as, the, um, as has been discussed, that higher voter turnout tends to result in a much more transit-friendly audience. But we just won uh, in Washington State a very rural uh, ballot measure at a special election in April. So just because you go in November doesn't mean that you're going to win. And just because you're going in April doesn't mean that you're going to lose. So I think it's uh, really important to just know the demographics, um, know what else is going to be on the ballot, and have a good sense of what your target audience could be to help uh, determine your likelihood of success. Good points. We'll have uh, time for at least one question and uh, possibly two here. But the, the, the question uh, uh, that I'd like to perhaps end with is um, uh, on polling, because several of you raised polling and the importance of it. Uh, and, and you re made reference to pollsters who sort of add to the campaign. Uh, my question is, do you think, uh, do you know the, uh, do, do, do you know the, how do, Bob, do the pollsters come in with the questions to ask, or are the questions to ask the, decided in a more collaborative uh, way? Um, All right, I'll jump in since no one else is, is yeah. talking. Um, yes, our, our team definitely came in with like 80% of what they wanted to do because they do this um, around the country. And then we were able to provide some input to about 20% of it, and they used their own pollsters. Um, so we, I think what we did is that we did a lot of due diligence in <coughs> getting the right 
consultants on board, and then we looked to them to provide the uh, the input uh, that they felt we needed to, to get the answers we did we needed to get. I would say our experience in the initial polling before our TSPLOS was very similar. Uh, they they we chose people that were experts in this kind of polling, and they they really drove. Um, the kind of questions we asked in the polling before the teeth boss, not the Metro Atlanta speak. Um, of course, what turned out to be our real problem was, you know, the identity of the teeth boss got wrapped up in transit, and there was people in suburban areas uh, that really felt like they were paying for transit then with their money, and they they strongly rejected that as an idea. The reality was the economics is that um, those more rural suburban areas weren't in fact paying. <laughs> for transit, they were paying for their own projects, and in fact, it was the opposite. The, the more urban areas were subsidizing the projects in the suburban areas. But that message um, never got across, truthfully, and that was something that hurt us in the final vote. Well, hey, uh, it's, it's time to close there. I apologize for a couple questions that we, we didn't get to, but I do want to make a, a final uh, comment on, first of all, thank the great presentations, and thank you, Kirsten, for getting them all posted. Uh, I do want to say APTA and, and NAPTA in particular has the coalition grant process. Uh, so we're looking to help local coalitions uh, do good things for their communities and sometimes a little bit of, little bit of resources can help go a long way. So we, we're, uh, there's a, a pending application uh, period open uh, through June 10th. So go to the APTA or NAPTA uh, websites to get information on the uh, coalition grants or uh, contact Zach Smith at APTA. So thank you all, and um, and I sorry, really quickly, quickly, Art. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to um, again say thank you so much to you and to our panelists for this great webinar. This is part of a series that we put together, CSEE and NAFTA. Um, it's called Six Stops to Success, the series, and this is the fourth webinar in that series. So our next one, and this is actually very timely given the interest and um, sort of importance of polling and uh, data that was mentioned by all of our panelists, I believe. Our next webinar is going to be on July 12th. It's on data, polling, and campaign intelligence. Uh, be sure to sign up for that. You can register on the CSTE website at cstee.org slash six dash stop. Um, and our final webinar will be sometime in September or October. The, the details of that are still being worked out, but check back in the next couple of weeks for more information on that. Um, and finally, if you have any questions that we didn't get to today because of time, please feel free to email me at info at cfte.org. And with that, thank you all for joining us, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.